Hello, everybody. So, I was hearing about popularity on C++. I joined the C++ uh, committee in 2008. By that time, every meeting of the, of the C++ committee was around 40 people. Then by C++ 11, I was so brave to organize the meeting where C++ 11 was approved in Madrid, 2011. That was a crowd, 70 people. Well, you may know that a couple of weeks ago, we met in Prague to approve C++ 20. Hey, we have C++ 20 now. Where's the applause? And for that meeting, 252 people were in a meeting for six days. So that is my measure of the popularity of the language. I will not make in public any st statement about other poor languages that are not in so good shape. <laughs> good. And you, you made feel this. Uh, you made me feel this graph, and you made me think about my experience in C++. So this year is my 31st year as a C++ programmer. I started programming in 1989. By the way, I was an intern in a company, and then in the first week, my boss came to me and gave me a book and told me, you know what, you are going to implement a prototype in an experimental language. We don't think it's going to be any successful at all, but just learned a little bit. And I implemented a prototype in C++, and here I am. Well. Well, I said something about this, and uh, well, I, uh, this is my job, uh, professor, but really, I'm a programmer. I'm a C++ programmer that happens to teach at the uh, university, and I have been some time uh, doing uh, C++ standardization. Uh, and those are my goals, to help people to get better performance, more energy efficiency, maintainability, and reliability. In practice, I want everything. And those are some recent projects and things I have been doing. But let's go to the thing. I'm going to talk or try to talk a little bit about parallelism in C++. So the, the first thing that came to my mind is Things have changed a lot. This is the first microprocessor. I was two years old then. In 1971, we had the first microprocessor, a four-bit microprocessor that was used to build these calculators. And uh, have a look. I have some data there, but the most important thing is clock frequency 100 kilohertz. This is the first computer I had. Many people at my age had that, the Sinclair Spectrum, which used a Psylog 80, and that was two megahertz. And eight bit uh, data, and we used to have a lot of video games with that. Yeah. Then I got a PC, and my first PC was 4 megahertz, and then you had a push button saying turbo, and it would run to 10 megahertz. Whoa. And this is probably the last single core uh, processor around 2003. This is a Pentium, some sort of uh, Pentium 3 gigahertz. And then the industry decided that uh, they wanted to do a different thing, and we started with dual cores and multi-cores in different flavors. This is one of the first interesting multi-cores, the i7 in year 2009. And 
well, many cars, many catches, many uninteresting things, but one interesting thing is around 3 gigahertz. And if you go to the computer you have today, and you have a look, it's probably around 3 gigahertz or even 2 gigahertz. And we are stuck there. A few years ago, Herb Sutter uh, wrote a very interesting article. The free lunch is over. It's on the internet, probably you have had the opportunity to look at some version of it, where he had a look uh, to the evolution. And you see that if you look at the, at the green line, which is the number of transistors integrated in a processor, this was ex uh, exponential growth. By the way, all these graphs are in logarithmic scale. But if you look to the blue line, which is clock speed, you have the same exponential growth until around 2005. And by 2005, the industry decided they no longer wanted or could increase clock frequency. And because you had more and more transistors, you have increased the integration scale, but you could not increase your clock frequency. The only option that you had was to use those transistors for other things. And the two major things that we have been doing since then is one, putting more cores per processor, and second, increasing catches. And here is where we are now. There are more interesting data here, and you can go to this old article. It's now uh, more than 12 years old or 15 years old, but it's still relevant and interesting. So, then uh, C++ started to think what that could mean uh, for the language. Well, if you have multi-cores, essentially, or multi-processing capabilities, essentially, there are two things that you can do with that. One is increase the throughput of your application, more transactions per second. Okay. And for getting that, you mostly do concurrent programming in different flavors. And the other thing is to increase performance. That means fast, faster execution of a task. And for that, you mostly do parallel programming. Uh, concurrent programming and parallel programming are not quite separate things. They are related. Uh, there are common techniques but the approaches you take are slightly different depending on what you really want. So in C++ 11 and 14, the language was focused in providing tools for concurrent programming. The most important feature for me of C++ 11, now that I look with some years from them, is nothing that you can see in the syntax. Is the, the, the clear definition of a memory model. And the first time we did that was in C++ 11. And that, that is a great feature. And of course we had some syntax, we had support for uh, third local storage, and we have a number of things in the library we have threads, we have mutexes, uh, we have condition variables, uh, we have uh, unique logs or log guards uh, and things uh, like that in the library. And we also have low level uh, things uh, for synchronization, uh, mostly atomics, atomic types, which are quite useful if you want to build yourself your own log-free data structure, 
and we have the support for multiple memory orders. Most of the time, if you don't say anything, you have sequential consistency, which is nice because it's not the fastest one, but is the one we can easily reason about. But on top of that, we have our memory orders, uh, mostly release acquired memory model, which is a bit harder to reason about, but sometimes it will give you better performance. So, this is concurrency. I'm not going to talk about concurrency today, sorry. If you want to know more about concurrency, there is an excellent book from Anthony Williams called C++ Concurrency in Action, which I recommend if you want to go to those topics. I'm done. Now, in C++ 17, a major thing we did is parallelism. Or some way of parallelism, I would say. Which is as easy as, you know, the algorithms that you have from the STL, the probably 90 algorithms. Well, the good news is that not all of them, but a vast majority of them, they are now parallel. Well, saying this, my talk would be over, but I, I need to give you some more details. So, now many algorithms have a parallel version. So this is the for each algorithm as you know it uh, today, taking two iterators and a lambda expression to do uh, something called function f of x or to every element. This is something that you can do today. Now, this is a sequential version. If you want to make it parallel, it's as simple as introducing one extra parameter that will be the first one, and you write there std colon colon execution colon colon par. You're done. That's parallel. And we have also the possibility to uh, being specific uh, about I want it sequential. So we have another policy which is std colon colon execution colon colon sec. That means I am running sequentially. That's it. So for example, if I wanted to process a bunch of images that I have in a vector of, I of image, and I load it from some file, and I want to do that in parallel, what I would do is write a for each std execution colon colon par, and then uh, my lambda expression would be apply image to gay to every image, image. And again, this would be a parallel loop. This also works with some other algorithms like sorting. So if you have a vector of customers and you have uh, some way of, uh, you want to sort with some custom criteria, uh, you could sort execution par and then provide as a lambda expression just the comparison criteria. In this case, I first, uh, if the names are the same, I use uh, the family name, otherwise I use the names. Well, or any other criteria that you want, uh, that you want to write. Um, because the comparison criteria is going to be executed a, a, a lot of times. Now, we can take advantage that we are, uh, having multiple cores uh, performing this to speed up my sorting. So this is what you have in C++ 17 and what I would call entry-level parallelism. Most algorithms are uh, supported and the library offers four execution policies. The first execution policy is SEC, which means uh, sequential, the algorithm executes in a single thread, but uh, some algorithms might have some changes in their interfaces 
over the algorithms you already know. I will show you in short one example of that. Uh, the other one is par, which means parallel. That means uh, the algorithm uses a bunch of threads, multiple threads, but you don't have vectorization. So sometimes you also may want to have parallelism in multiple threads and also vectorization. And then you have a different policy, which is par and sec parallel and sequenced. And that means that there are multiple threads and that we have extra assumptions that will allow that every thread uses vectorization. Sim the instructions. And then this is what you have in C17. In C20, you will have one extra policy, which is XTD execution and sec, which means in a single thread, but vectorization is allowed. We have some constraints on iterators. So many algorithms in the STL, as you know of it uh, today, uh, use input iterators. When we go to the new interface, the minimum we require is forward iterators. That means that here you have a difference. So it's not as simple as uh, I'm going to replace the old stuff because the old algorithms still have a place when you have uh, input iterators. And the minimum general requirement is forward iterators. That means that uh, iterators need to be multi-pass because it's the way I will divide my sequence in multiple subsequences that can be uh, given to different threads. Also, some algorithms may have changed the return type. For uh, example, the algorithm for each that you have today returns the unary function. And this sometimes is useful because you can store something in the unary function as a data member and later on uh, make use of it. Now, the new algorithm does not return the unary function. And the reason again is because otherwise I could not build properly a parallel version of the algorithm. Ah, exceptions. Not very nice what I am going to say now. So if uh, anything that you call from your algorithm throws an exception, the exception is not propagated. We will invoke std terminate. And your program will die. Sorry about that. Uh, we, I hope we will have a better solution in the future. So when should I avoid to use the new policy based, uh, execution policy based algorithms? If I want to use input or output iterators, that is one reason. If I want to avoid STD terminate on exceptions, but uh, it's not so usual that the code that you run in parallel uh, as a comparison criteria or something like that will throw, so it's not a big issue. Uh, if you want to avoid side effects uh, on use of elements or if you want to make use of the return values of the algorithms, like uh, the case we saw with uh, std for each. Otherwise, I would move to the new ones because it's very easy to switch be between sequential and parallel uh, versions. Now, one thing I have to say about for each is that every time I see in code for each, what comes to my mind is you didn't think during enough time which was the algorithm you wanted. Probably there is a better algorithm to be used. So, for example, I had this sequential code 
where what I want to count is how many elements in my vectors are greater than zero. And I have, I have this uh, bright idea of uh, having a count and then updating the, uh, updating the count in every iteration. Well, then I move to my parallel version and I need, uh, I need to do something because here I have a race condition. Multiple threads will be updating the count at the same time and this is a problem. So what I was taught at school is that I need to uh, have some concurrency control and then I add this mutex to make sure that I get exclusive access to the count and that multiple threads do not update the count at the same time. The slight problem that I have then is that I get an horrendous slowdown because remember, a mutex, every time you acquire a mutex, every time you release a mutex, every time you use a condition variable, you are performing a system call, an operating system call. And that means that the cost of these operations are in the range of microseconds. But all the thing that you wanted is just to update uh, this uh, tiny counter. So a better approach might be use an atomic. And with an atomic uh, counter, you get rid of all the concurrency problem. And you would be solving like this. In general, it's a bad idea to update global state from anything that is called from a parallel algorithm. But even better, I said you didn't think enough. You have the perfect algorithm for that, which is count if. And then you are done. So every time that you write a for each, probably you, you are uh, mimicking something that is in any other algorithm in the STL. And uh, I repeat, you have around 90 different algorithms. So atomics is something that you can use sometimes, but better probably use a better algorithm. Uh, then we have uh, transformations. So this is a well-known pattern in functional programming, the map pattern, which applies a transformation to all elements uh, in a collection. For example, here I have a vector of doubles, and I want in parallel to produce a new vector with the squares of the values. This is something uh, that can be done uh, very simply with the transform algorithm. You take a sequence of elements, and then you just specify what is the operation you want to apply to every element in your collection. And this will be done in parallel for all the elements. Of course, if your vector has 100 elements, this is a very bad idea. But if your vector has 1 million elements, this is a very good idea. Uh, you want to add two vectors. Uh, you can also do this because transform in the STL has two versions. One version taking one sequence and a second version taking two input sequences and producing an output sequence. Do you want to do with three or more? You can't. With this version, you can't. You only have transform from one sequence and two sequences, no more than that. Uh, you could also perform transformations where the input and output data are from different types. For example, I could have a vector with doubles that are real uh, parts of a complex number and another vector with the imaginary part, and I want to generate a new vector with complex numbers. I can do like that, and my lambda takes a, an R and an I and produces a complex of double with the R and the I. Nice. Yeah. Then uh, we had in the STL accumulate, which allows you to add all the elements in a collection. Well, accumulate has no version that is parallel. Instead, 
we have a new algorithm that does the right thing and is called reduce. So if reduction computes the sum of all elements in a data set where sum is an arbitrary operation that you can uh, define. So it looks quite similar to accumulate, but in this case, the result is not deterministic unless the sum operation is both associative and commutative. And uh, this has some uh, downsides. But for example, if I have a vector of uh, doubles and I want to add all the elements, I just say reduce. Because if I don't say nothing, the initial uh, value is zero and the operation is the addition. Or I could say my initial value is 100 because I want a different uh, initial value, you can do that. Or you can provide as a lambda expression what is your reduction operation. And then I have map reduce. Everybody got crazy in the last years with map reduce, and we have map reduce in C. The only thing is that map reduce in C is not called map reduce. But map reduce is just the composition of a map stage and then on the or a transformation, and then on the results you apply a reduction. So we spell this transform reduce. And this is a very simple transform reduce, which is going to compute the norm of the modulus of a vector, which means that my map operation is to a square each value, that is the second lambda, and my reduce operation is the addition, so it's a sum of squares. Or if I have a vector of shapes, and I want uh, to add all the areas of all the shapes, I just do a, a transform reduce, and then the transform uh, is computing the area. I wrote map reduce, should be transform reduce, sorry. And the reduction is adding. But then I. I have a colleague at my office that uh, he's a fan of Scala, and he told me, but you don't have the canonical example of map reduce. And I said, oh yes, what is the canonical example of map reduce? And he told me, computing word frequencies in a text. So I told him, yes, I can, and I will do in a single slide. So word frequency takes a vector of strings. So, to make things shorter, I have this type def. Dictionary is an std map of string and long. So, it's a key value thing where keys are strings and values are integral numbers. And then at this time, I call the write API transform reduce in parallel. And I use as an input sequence the whole vector of words. So I assume that I have a, a vector where every word is in one position of the vector. And my initial value for my map reduce is the empty dictionary. Dictionary open by closed base is the empty dictionary. Okay. And then this is my uh, addition. It's a lambda that takes two dictionaries, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and produces a new dictionary. And what I do is when I have two dictionaries and I need to merge them, is I iterate with, I'm using this structure binding here for simplicity, I iterate with key value on the right-hand uh, side dictionary, and for every element, what I do is update the left-hand side. So I have merged both dictionaries, and then I return this new dictionary. And finally, the only thing I need is what is my map thing? My map thing is given a word, I produce a dictionary 
with only that word and with counter one. And then when I do the merging, uh, I do a tree merging and I am producing the word uh, frequency map done in one slide. And for this, I have for free the sequential and the parallel version. Okay. The last algorithms that were not in the standard library and were added for C++ uh, 17 are different flavors of scans. And a scan is quite similar to a reduction, but is uh, you have a sequence of values and then you produce a new sequence of values where they are partial reductions of uh, the original sequence. So if uh, you have the sequence x0, x1, x2, x3, you produce a new sequence which is x0, and then x0 plus x1, and then x0 plus x1 plus uh, x2, and so on. And we have this because there are very well-known parallel algorithms to do this very efficiently. And there are some interesting use cases. For example, if I have a vector which is representing an histogram, and I want to compute uh, the cumulative frequency table is as simple as uh, running a scan on the histogram and uh, I will produce the cumulative table. Uh, this is interesting in some algorithms uh, related to processing a histogram for, for images. And in this case, I also have a transform a scan which allows me to perform some transform stage before uh, doing the scan. So uh, this is also interesting. Uh, do I have more parallel algorithms? Yes, but I cannot provide the example of all of them because as I said, they are almost 90. So I make a negative list. Those are the algorithms that have no parallel versions and they fit in one slide. So accumulate inner product and partial zoom. Well, that's not quite true. Uh, it just happens that we have new names that are reduce, uh, scan, inclusive scan and exclusive uh, scan and, uh, and so on. So we, we have them. And uh, then what about uh, backwards algorithm, copy backward and move backward. Uh, it's nonsense to have a parallel version of that. Uh, so with copy and move, you have enough. Uh, search with some specific custom searchers will not have parallel version. And then things having to do with uh, permutations, bounds, and heap algorithms. Anything else that you can think of, uh, find, find if anything that you have in the STL, you have a parallel version and these principles I have shown apply uh, to them. So that is what you have today. I want to give you a five minute grasp also on what might come after 20. So there are no major updates in 20. Of course, you will have some new things in terms of concurrency. You will finally have a semaphore type and some other things, but nothing impressive. Now, for after 20, we are working on executors. You may have heard about the executor's proposal. Current proposal is version 11. So anything that I am going to say now is subject to complete change at any moment. The last time I was here two years ago, I was pretty sure that we would have contracts in C++ 20, and I presented this as something that was almost in the standard, and you may know the sad news, contracts were junked out of the standard. So just uh, don't take what I am going to say now very seriously. So a possible feature of computations is 
we, are, uh, we envision that we want to have composition of networked asynchronous parallel computations and that this needs to be accelerated by diverse hardware and by diverse hardware I mean multi-cores, GPUs, FPGAs, whatever you may think of. But what we have today is a steady thread, a steady atomic. Async features and things like features are uh, constantly under discussion because they do not fit uh, all the needs. And then we have parallel algorithms, but the parallel algorithms that I've told you, well, I consider them what I call entry-level parallelism. It's nice to get some parallelism, but as soon as you want to do more advanced parallelism stuff, it's not enough because you don't have the uh, knobs to set up parallelism in a specific way. So it's nice, but it's not uh, complete. They are not flexible, and the other problem they have is that they are not composable. Look, for example, that I, uh, I have no means of composing the transform and the reduce, and this is why I need a specific thing called transform reduce instead of composing the transform with the reduce. So the, the solution that we are currently working on uh, it has two components. One is the executor, and the second one is the sender and the receiver. So an executor is an interface to execute work somewhere. A simple example of this is we will probably have a class static thread pool where you can build your own thread pools, as many as you want. In this case, P is a thread pool composed of 16 threads. And then from any thread pool, I can get an executor, which is a thing, is an abstraction, a lightweight abstraction of a place where I can execute things. But I could also have an executor that is uh, a GPU executor, and then the things I send to that executor will be run in the GPU. And then to any executor, with any executor, I can call the function execute. I pass the executor, and then I pass a lambda, and the lambda will be ex run in the executor, by the executor, where it is. And then uh, if we want to compose complex chains of computations, we uh, may have the sender-receiver uh, pattern. So I can start by uh, creating a sender begin, and I do this in this case by uh, calling a schedule with an executor. And this is just a handle, uh, something, that, something that is attached to the executor. And then I can build another sender by calling then with the first handle and a lambda. And then I can build another one attaching to the previous one and another lambda. And in this way I am building a chain of lambdas that will be executed. And that the return value of one of them maps to the input to the next one. And finally, I build a receiver, and I can build any lambda as a receiver. And with this, I do submit the sender and the receiver. And by this call, I attach the sender and the receiver, and everything is, uh, this whole chain is executed in that specific executor. And really what is an executor is just a lightweight handle to anything, any place where we can execute things. A very simple executor, this is the simplest executor you can implement, which is, which is an executor that whatever you give to the executor, it immediately runs it. And for this, I only need a function execute that takes a function and that invokes that function, done. Okay, 
Uh, another capability that an, an executor might have is bulk execution, and this some of them will have, some will, of them will not have. If they have that uh, capability, then the executor can be called with a function and an index, and that means that we don't launch a different task for every iteration in my iteration space, but I can put a number of iterations in a single task. And this is a, a nice way of implementing a parallel for each, for example. So uh, here you have uh, having uh, the bulk uh, execute. Here you have how I would implement such a parallel for each. Some people have even envisioned something in the longer term. I would predict not having this before 26. But why not in thinking things like this, where you may use the pipe operator and then you just produce value three that is sent to one executor and then this is chained with a then and then with another then and then sent to a different uh, computing device and then uh, I have a function to handle error so that I can write something very similar to what you can write today with uh, ranges in C++20 but in an asynchronous uh, way. That is probably way too far, and I would not expect being able to write things like this uh, before 26. So, now let me show, let me take a different path. So, it's time to show something about my own toy. Uh, at my group, we have a library with a horrible name uh, that tries to offer uh, something that I did not cover yet. And uh, that is pipeline parallelism, which is similar to the, my, my last slide, but in a, in a different way. So we have our own framework and we have something that is not executors but have the same idea of abstracting different ways of execution. So what we decided is that we provide different policies of things that others have implemented. So we have uh, a C, uh, ISO C++ threads version and we have an OpenMP version and we have an Intel TV version and you, we have a FastFlow, another experimental framework version and we have a sequential version and on top of all that we also have a dynamic execution so that we can switch from one runtime to another runtime uh, during execution. Okay, and those uh, execution policies that we have here in our own library, well, they have some knobs like controlling the concurrency degree or how many threads uh, you have. Now, the part of the whole library that uh, I am interested in telling you something is the pipelines. So, a pipeline is another computational pattern where you have multiple stages and basically you have one stage producing data, perhaps you are getting data from the network or from a file, and you are sending to the next stage that does something and then sends value to the next stage and so on. For example, you could be receiving a video and every time you have a frame you send to the next stage and the next stage performs a Fourier transform on the image and then sends to the next stage that probably filters the image and then you send to the next stage, blah, 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 blah. So the simplest... Uh, a pipeline is a top level pipeline that has a generator, a function that generates values and a number of functions that takes values and send to the next stage. So for me a generator is anything, anything that can be invoked, that takes no argument and that returns a value that may hold or not 
a value. If it holds a value, okay, I send the value. If it has nothing, is end of string, I'm done. The return value should be of any type that is copy constructible or move constructible, so that is valid, and that is contextually convertible to bool, okay, and that can be that referenced. Well, I think you know some types that uh, fulfill all these properties. Uh, probably the first thing that comes to your mind is pointers, but we don't use pointers that much these days. And we have something much better for this, which is optional. So we use optionals for generators. So here is an example of a pipeline in our framework where the first stage is just producing values from zero to n, and each time it produces a value, or when we reach to end of stain, we just produce the empty value. And then the next stage takes an integer and produces a double, the next stage takes a double and produces another double, the next stage takes a double and does not return nothing because it's the last one. And this is the way of composing with multiple lambdas where you can compose uh, a pipeline. You may also have a nesting. And if you want to have nesting, you could do things uh, like this. I have a pipeline, and then I have one stage which uses a file and reads values uh, from a file. And when I uh, reach to end of file, I return the empty optional. And then inside my second stage is another pipeline with multiple stages. So nesting is okay. A pipeline can be a, a stage of a pipeline. And then my last stage writes things out. Or some people do not feel very comfortable with all this uh, syntax and prefer to write the lambdas independently and then the call to the pipeline just provide all these lambdas. Well, I find that uh, people with m more a C background would prefer this second way of doing things. I have no position on that. Uh, sometimes one thing that happens with uh, sometimes, uh, uh, with a pipeline is that not all stages have the same computational cost. You have one stage that takes much longer, and a pipeline is as fast as its slowest stage. So what we can do is for that uh, heavyweight stage, we replicate the stage multiple times. And now each item coming will go to one of them and then join uh, later. And we do this by a farm call, and then we, in this case I am replicating the second stage because I consider it's going to take longer, four times, so I have four threads devoted to do that. Of course this introduces uh, some problems. Here you have an example where I am improving a video, so I have a, a stage reading, uh, frames, I call the improver and then I have a stage for writing it. And the improver is a farm of four uh, exactly equal lambdas. Uh, of course, doing this has a problem because as soon as you have uh, multiple replicas, it might uh, happen that one item bypass, bypasses another item and then in the output, data is not equally ordered which is nasty if you are processing videos and you don't see the frames in the same order. So to control this, the execution policies have a, a knob to decide if you want to keep things in order or not. Of course, keeping things in order is slightly slower and needs a bit more memory, but at least you see things as you would like to see them. And you also uh, may decide to use blocking or non-blocking queues, but this is a, uh, an internal detail. Uh, the last pattern I'm going to see today is a filter, which allows you sometimes to decide to discard some items. For example, here you have a pipeline 
where I am gener generating numbers, and then in the second stage, I decide to keep in the pipeline only the numbers that are prime numbers. So any other number is discarded. Or in this other case, I am reading words from a text file, and I decided to discard any word that is less than four characters long. Well, this is another thing that I, I can do with the pipeline. This pipeline li library has uh, much more things. We have been using it in, in real applications, for example, uh, for uh, analyzing 3D images in uh, brain re uh, magnetic resonance in medical equipment, and we got uh, very good improvements in very few development days. So it is something that we have used in industrial applications. So, and I hope to be on time for my small summary. We live in a parallel world. I think this time parallelism has come to stay. So I'm sorry. Well, uh, we thought that uh, 20 or 30 years ago, and uh, it didn't happen, but it looks like this time is happening. So get used to parallelism, get used to parallel computing is here in any, in any application. I've seen wonderful applications of parallel computing for mobile phones. So it's not a supercomputer thing anymore. You have many portable concurrency primitives since C++ 11. They are low level, they are good or good enough to solve some concurrency problems related to improving the throughput or some applications. And C++17 gives you what I call entry-level parallelism, which is mostly data parallelism. You have here a data set and you want to apply the same operation to all the elements in your data set. Okay, good enough. But remember that you don't have the fine-tuning uh, knobs to ha have a better control uh, on parallelism, and also that that parallelism is not very composable. C++ 23, hopefully, and I cannot promise this, and I will never promise again that a version of the language is going to bring something, but hopefully it might bring executors which might give you a better control on execution, not only parallel, but also asynchronous. And the stream parallelism is something still to be solved in a nice way. I have shown you something about our own uh, experimental library, but it's an experimental library, and that is something that I do not foresee in the standard uh, before 26. I might be wrong. And that's all. Thank you very much. And I want to take the opportunity also to thank CPP Europe organizers. This is my second time here, and I'm impressed on this gathering of people interested in C++, and I'm very happy to be, to be here in Bucharest. Thank you. <laughs>